All right, if we could turn, please, to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 21. Now we're going to read from verse 18 to the end of the chapter, the finishing section. And it begins this way. It says, verily, verily. Very familiar terms to us. We've heard that many times through this gospel. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So we're about to complete a journey that we began, believe it or not, on September the 20th, 2020. So this has been going on for quite a while. And uh, this is going to be the 56th message uh, on the gospel by John. And so I want to thank you for bearing with us through this journey. And I trust that it has been a blessing to your soul as it has been to my soul as I've considered this gospel afresh. And so this section uh, really is dealing with uh, clearing up a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding that was circulating in the early church and uh, that uh, is amazing how rumors begin. And it was a rumor that had been spread that John the apostle would not die until Christ came. He would uh, he'd be alive when Christ came. And so that's the, the, the context of our section. But it begins with uh, the Lord continuing his conversation with Peter. And he's just spoken to Peter about his life and ministry. He's just restored him, uh, not to fellowship. He did that in a private meeting, uh, but restored him to a service, to apostleship, recommissioned him, we might say. And yet in the context of that conversation, uh, of talking to Peter about his new responsibilities, not only as a fisher of men, but also to feed the sheep and tend the lambs and all the rest of it. He then goes on to speak to Peter about his martyrdom. And he says to him, and he talks about three time frames in Peter's life. He begins by saying, when you were young, and he says, you girded yourself and walked whether you, wherever you would. And so he talks about his younger days where he basically uh, went where he wa wanted to go, did what he wanted to do. But he said, when you're old, that's not going to happen. Somebody else is going to carry you to a place you may not want to go. <laughs> uh, you are uh, going to be out of control, control of the situation. Uh, another is going to be uh, dealing with you. And he's going to speak about the manner of his death. And then in this section, he's also going to talk about in the intervening period. And he's going to talk about in the intervening period between when you were young and when you're old, what are you to do now? And he's going to tell him simply this, follow thou me. In other words, even now you can't do what you want. You have to do what I want. You have to be my follower, my disciple. You, Peter, follow me. And it's wonderful to think about these things that, uh, in a sense, our own lives kind of mirror this. Uh, in a sense, we, we have no real control 
over our death. Uh, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And the one who makes that appointment is not us. It's the Lord. And so we have no control over that. And uh, when we're young, we thought we could do what we pleased. But when we came to know the Lord Jesus, it changed everything. And we can no longer do what we please. We're instructed to follow him. <laughs> and we're to do the things that please him, not the things that please ourselves. So there is a little bit of a, a parallel. But it must have been quite a shock for Peter, uh, having just been restored uh, to uh, apostleship, restored to service, and uh, all the joy connected with that, and immediately to be confronted about his death and for the Lord to discuss his death with him in such an open manner. And what Peter, Peter's told is the day would come when he would be totally under the control of his Roman executioners who would carry him where he would not wish to go to death. And so, he, and of course, what he says to him is, that when you're old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not, end of verse 18. And we're told the exact interpretation of this. What does this exactly mean? This spake he, John tells us, signifying by what death he should glorify God. It is interesting that he is told by what death he should glorify God. Remember the Lord Jesus? He talked about his death. Uh, being a time when he would be glorified. Now the hour is come when the Son of Man will be glorified. And uh, now Peter is told that he is going to share that experience of glorifying God in his death. And so he, too, will have that experience, glorifying God in his death. Of course, Peter uh, knew this uh, it stuck in his mind, and he lived, in a sense, the rest of his life in the shadow of martyrdom. And if you look at Second Peter, uh, you'll notice uh, that in Second Peter chapter 1, there's a, a definite reference to the fact that the time was fast approaching when he would put off his tabernacle, his tent, and so 2 Peter 1, verse 13, Yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. So he refers back to this incident. He, he knew uh, that the day was coming when he would put off this tabernacle, this tent. Aren't we glad, by the way, uh, this is just a tent. <laughs> it's not our final abode, our final dwelling place. It's just temporary, and uh, we're going to change it, and we're going to put on uh, this new body and this new life and new experience uh, one second after death. So, so Peter lived all the rest of his life under the shadow, in a sense, of a cross. And <clears throat> it's interesting that uh, we're told uh, by early church tradition, that he indeed did share in the means or the method of death that the Lord Jesus experienced, and that Peter was crucified, uh, but he refused, we're told, to be crucified the same way as his master, and he asked that he would be crucified upside down. And so he was literally carried uh, to that place where he suffered martyrdom for the Lord Jesus. Of course, in the meantime, Peter's told very specifically, when he has spoken this, he said to him, verse 19, follow me. You're going to glorify me in your death, and I want you also to glorify me in your life. I want you to follow me. And of course, that is the, the key issue in every Christian's life. As the Lord Jesus followed the Father's will, so his disciples should follow the will of their Lord, to do what he bids us to do, uh, to follow him, to follow his commands, to follow his example, uh, to, to follow his leading in our lives. Uh, this message is for all of us. Uh, follow thou me. We should be followers, devoted followers of our illustrious master, 
the Lord Jesus. And for some, like Peter, it would lead to martyrdom. And the church uh, history, the annals of church history is filled with examples of men who glorified God in their death through martyrdom. But as we've mentioned before, there's two ways that we can be a martyr. We can lay down our lives all at once, like Stephen, uh, like Peter, uh, in a, in a, a one-off event. Or we can lay down our lives incrementally, one day at a time. If any man will follow me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. And so basically, either, either way, uh, he, what he's saying, follow me, to follow me is the way of death. It's the way of life. We know that. But it's also the way of death. It's a, da- a daily dying to self and living for him. We can either do it incrementally, one day at a time, living wholly for him, or we can do it all at once like the great martyrs of history. And I want to just uh, think of just one verse in Philippians, just to throw into the mix here, Philippians chapter 1. And we think of Paul and similar thoughts uh, in the idea of glorifying the Lord. He says in verse 20 of Philippians 1, or verse yeah, 20, he said, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what Paul says is, my my goal, my objective is to magnify Christ. That's a beautiful idea, isn't it? Magnification is the idea of making something that appears small to look bigger. And so he says, my goal is to make the Lord Jesus look bigger than most people perceive him to be. Now, we're not saying he's not big. He's, he's immense. He's, he's the God of heaven. But in a lot of people's minds, he isn't significant. And so he says, my objective is to make Christ look bigger to men than he really is. And I want to do that either through my life or through my death. It doesn't make any difference which way it is for to me to live Christ and to die as gain. And again, we we should be like this ourselves, having this desire that we might glorify, make look good, make look impressive, magnify the Lord Jesus by our lives. And Uh, It's a great way to start every day, isn't it? To start the day by just expressing, first of all, our dependence, because we can't do this in our own strength, and then say, Lord, today, whatever the day brings forth, would you help me to make the Lord Jesus look good? Would you help me to make him look bigger in the eyes of men than they may have previously considered? What a a wonderful way to live. And so this this is what's in view here. Follow me, he says. You can glorify me in your death. You can glorify me in your life by following me. And then, of course, Peter, it says in verse 20, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? So contextually, he's been speaking to the Lord Jesus, or the Lord Jesus has been speaking to him, and then uh, he gets the sense that John is somewhere behind him, and he turns around, takes his eyes off the Lord Jesus, and looks at John for a moment. And basically um, says, well, what about him? What's going to happen? You've told me what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen to him? We just wonder, I'm just throwing this out. I don't want to be dogmatic about it, but I wonder if Peter, perhaps slightly, even subconsciously, was a bit jealous of John's special closeness to the Lord Jesus. You notice uh, how John describes himself here, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Quite an interesting dis- description, isn't it? And, and also leaned on his breast. In other words, enjoyed such intimacy with the Lord Jesus. 
and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And the Lord shared with him uh, these details. And so maybe there's just a little bit of jealousy. And so he, he said, well, well, what about him? You've told me what's going to happen to me. What about this man's future? What's his future look like? And, and one of the, I guess, warnings for all of us is that we've got to be careful that we don't take our eyes off the Lord Jesus to look at other Christians. We need to follow him. And it's, it's easy, isn't it, to do that? Well, well, what about this person? What about this believer? And to be overly curious about others. Scripture says those that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Remember, we looked at that in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. And we're told, look to Jesus. It's interesting that the context of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, comes right after Hebrews 11. And so there's a proper, in a sense, way of looking at this. Yes, we, we certainly are inspired by the lives of others, these great cloud of witnesses that have gone before. And we thank God for them and for their example. We're, we're thankful for the Caleb's and the Joshua's and the, uh, the Moses and the, uh, all these different heroes, the Abrahams, and we're, we're thankful for every one of them. But ultimately, every one of them have their flaws. And the one person we need to keep our eyes firmly on is the Lord Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's so easy for us to get distracted by other Christians and what others are doing and to lose the sense of our purpose. What, what does he want from me? What's his purpose for me? He wants me to follow him. I'm supposed to follow him. Uh, we can allow our curiosity about others to distract us from following the Lord. So Peter's main concern should not be a comparison of his lot with that of his friend, rather the fulfillment of the purpose of the Lord Jesus in his life. And so he says, never mind him, <laughs> you must follow me, Peter. That's what the Lord is saying. And so he says, turning about, see of the disciple whom Jesus loved following. He says in verse 21, Peter seeing him saith." To Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus saith to him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? In other words, it's not your business, Peter. Your business is to follow me. And of course, he says, If I will that he tarry till I come. It's interesting that the Lord's last words recorded for us in the Gospel of John go like this till i come follow thou me isn't that interesting till i come it's a it's an allusion to the fact that he's coming right at the end of the gospel of john it's interesting that john doesn't really say a whole lot about the second coming of the lord jesus we have John 14 don't we verses one through three about going to the father's house preparing a place for us and coming to, to get us and take us to be uh, with himself. Uh, we, we have that definite statement, but you don't have anything of the Olivet Discourse that is found in the synoptics. Very little teaching in the Gospel of John about the second coming. But the last words of the Lord Jesus are, till I come. He says, Jesus says to him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. This is very important for us to understand, that we're to recognize that until he comes, we're to follow him. <laughs> That's what we're to do. And of course, he is going to come. Do this in remembrance of me until I come, right? We're to follow him till he comes. And the Lord is coming. Of course, John ever lived with anticipation of the coming of the Lord Jesus. And of course, he refers to it in his first epistle 
uh, about the, the coming of the Lord Jesus with a sense of excitement, right? He looks forward to it, uh, that, that, that we're going to see him. We're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is. And he says, little children, it's the last hour. And so he certainly lived in expectation, but he wants to clear up a misunderstanding. You see, what occurred as a result of the Lord saying this, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? What happened was it started a rumor. And the rumor went like this. He says, then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not to him, he should not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So this rumor began to circulate in the early church that John the Apostle would be alive when Jesus came. And uh, it's amazing how the rumors get started and how they tend to change color and how tenaciously they're held on to. And so, of course, the fact that John lived much longer than the other disciples tend to strengthen this rumor. Uh, remember, he, he's writing uh, kind of many years after the event, uh, the events, 50 years afterwards. He's still alive. And so as a result of that, this kind of rumor got strengthened. The Lord's going to come, but, but he won't come. Uh, <clears throat> uh, after John dies, he's going to come while John is still alive. And so that rumor was, was going around very vehemently. Yeah, and, and in fact, so, so definite was that rumor uh, that even after John died, even 50 years after he died, there were still people that believed that John was still alive in the tomb waiting for the coming of Christ. <laughs> Isn't that amazing uh, how these rumors persist? Uh, he was still alive in his tomb waiting for the Lord to come. Well, that's not what the Lord said. And John wants to dispel it and clear it up. What he did say was, if I will. And obviously, it wasn't his will. John died. <clears throat> but in one sense, John got a very beautiful look at the coming of Christ, didn't he? Uh, John was the one who was taken up to heaven in Revelation chapter 4 and was shown things that must be hereafter. And so certainly he did get a glimpse of the things concerning the end times that no one else got to see. And so he was certainly privileged in many ways. Uh, but he, he certainly lived his life in the expectation of the coming of the Lord Jesus. But he just wanted to dispel that rumor. He says, if I will, that he tarry till I come. What is that to thee? One thing that he tells us is this in verse 24. He says, this is the disciple which testifieth of these things. John was a very credible witness of the marvelous superlative life of the Lord Jesus. He had been with the Lord Jesus from the beginning of his public ministry. He had been close to him, as we've already mentioned this morning. He, he enjoyed an intimacy with the Lord Jesus uh, greater than any other man, perhaps. Uh, so he, he'd been a loyal disciple from the beginning to the end. He'd been an eyewitness of this magnificent drama of God manifest in flesh. And he had been um, one who was a pioneer in the early church. Uh, he, he was one who had suffered for its cause, who had uh, been strong in defending its doctrines. And he had given a lot of thought over more than half a lifetime to the story. And then he tells it to us. His memory quickened, his pen driven on by the Spirit of God who would lead him into all truth. God breathed. He gives for us an, an inerrant record of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, an inspired account, a credible witness. And so he says, this is the disciple which testifieth of these things. It is interesting that this word testify, witness, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a theme in the Gospel of John. The word is used 47 times throughout the Gospel. And so it's the idea of te- he, he's, he's willing to take a stand and testify to the reality of the things which he has witnessed. This is the disciple which testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And of course, the question is, well, who's the we now? He says, he, he starts out by saying this testimony is true. And he says, we know now. He's, he's, he's got a we statement. And I believe what he's referring to is not just he testifies to these things, but all that believe his testimony also know that these things are true. Do you remember back in chapter 20 and verse 30 and 31, many of the signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, but these are written in this book. They're written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so he says, not only do I witness of it, but we know it's true. Those of us that have believed his eyewitness report. Can't you say, can't you add your name to that this, this morning and say, we know that his testimony is true? Do you believe that, that his testimony is true, the testimony of John? I think you do, don't you? We believe this. We believe it's true. And then he says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And so remember the story of the Queen of Sheba when she had heard the fame of Solomon, and she made that journey to find out if it was really true. And when she saw it uh, and his majesty and all the rest of it, she, her breath was taken away. And she makes this incredible statement. She says, the half hath not been told me. And I really believe that what John is saying here is this. I'm only telling you a fraction of the story, but the world couldn't contain the whole story. In, in fact, he, he says, when you get to glory, I'm, gonna, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, when you get to glory, you're going you're gonna to say right along with the Queen of Sheba, the half has not been told me. In fact, he says, uh, the, the world couldn't contain it, the books. And it's amazing. I've been setting up my library, and one of the biggest sections in my library are books on the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. (laughs) I just have a whole segment, several shelves, just on the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And and so uh, we think of all that has been written, but even if we included all that has been written, it doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, I believe it's going to take all eternity to tell that story. Ephesians 2 verse 7 says that in the ages to come, We're going to be learning about the exceeding riches of his grace towards us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been at this for 56 sessions, and we have a lot more sessions to do in eternity. We will be learning throughout all eternity. We'll be still in school. I know you thought you got out of school, but no, you didn't. We'll be still in school in eternity. The school of the exceeding riches of his grace towards us in Christ Jesus is going to be our subject matter. And it will take all eternity for us to be able to take in the fullness of the wonders of the story of the Son of God. Amos 7.10 says, the land is not able to bear all his words. And here we read, the world couldn't possibly contain the books that should be written to give the full story of the Son of God. Now, I want to just kind of, that kind of concludes the book. And as you know, we've got some time left. And what I want to do is just do a quick summary. It's not going to be a lengthy thing. But I was just thinking about this uh, as I was I'm actually reading through John's gospel in my own readings at the moment. And I was, I was thinking, how do you summarize this incredible book? 
And the, the way I, I look at John, I, I see it this way. To me, the summary is this. This is the gospel of the eternal son of God, the Lord from heaven. It, it's emphasizing in a, in a marvelous way that the Lord Jesus is the eternal son of God, one with the father and the one that came into this world. And so the Old Testament kind of spoke about this question. I want us to go back to Proverbs 30 just for a moment, the book of Proverbs and chapter 30 and verse 4. And there's a kind of question that is asked. And I do believe that the answer to this question is given in the Gospel of John. And the question goes like this, who hath ascended up into heaven? Or who descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Or who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. So who is this one? What is his name? What is his son's name? Well, I think John tells us. His son's name is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is that eternal son that was ever one with the father. And not only that, there's another statement in the Old Testament in the prophecy of Isaiah. Let's just look at this for a moment. One that we're familiar with, especially at this time of year, as we've just come through the Christmas period. Uh, if ever there's a verse that is connected with it, it's this one. Uh, and it's uh, Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. We think of that babe born in Bethlehem. But then it says, unto us a son is given. That child that was born is also the son that was given, the eternal son of God, one with the father that was given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So as we look at the Gospel of John, I want to just suggest to you that really what it is doing is revealing to us the eternal Son of God. That's its purpose. And, and it just as we go through, I'm going to run through a, a few scriptures in John just to show that that seems to be the recurring theme, that he is the eternal Son of God, the Lord from heaven, the gospel of the eternal Son of God. John 1 and verse 34 it says this. This is John the baptizer. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So John the baptizer gives this testimony. Chapter 1, verse 49, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. John's gospel, chapter 3 and verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because, because of why? Why is somebody who has not believed condemned already? Because he's not believed in the name of, of the only begotten Son of God. So what condemns men is their failure to believe the testimony that John brought, that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And that's what condemns men, that they refuse to believe that. And that's why they're condemned already. And savingly believing is the testimony. <clears throat> that he is the son of God and believing that you have life through his name. John chapter five, verse 25. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the son of God and they that hear shall live. Again, this, this son of God, the dead one day, every person will hear that voice of the son of god just as lazarus heard the voice of the son of god saying lazarus come forth the hour is coming and now is the dead will hear the voice of the son of god chapter nine let's just look at john nine and again we see this testimony to the son of god <laughs> and we'll break in in verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. This is the man who was born blind. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? 
And Jesus said to him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. <laughs> Who is the Son of God? The Lord Jesus is the Son of God. What's his name? Uh, it's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He believed, and he worshipped him as God. John's Gospel, chapter 10, and verse 36. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world that thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. See, they had him crucified for blasphemy, for claiming that he was the Son of God. They understood what he was saying. And they understood it to be a blasphemous for, for you being a man to make yourself God, to, to take that claim to be the son of God. They, they found that to be utterly blasphemous. And yet he truly is the son of God. That's what this book is about, testifying to it. Chapter 11, verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God might be glorified thereby. Son of God, be glorified by the raising of Lazarus. Chapter 11, verse 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Again, what a confession from Martha. Look at John's Gospel, chapter 19, now, and verse 7. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. The reason why he had to die? Because he made himself the son of God. Well, no, he didn't make himself the son of God. He is the son of God. That's what this book is about. John 20, verse 31. It says, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one the Son of God, in that believing you might have life through his name. And so what really is the gospel all about? It's the testimony of John. And the testimony is true. And the testimony is simply this, that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the eternal Son, one with the Father, the one that came into the world. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so this concludes, a little bit early today, but it concludes our study in the Gospel of John. And again, we say, along with others, we believe wholeheartedly with all our hearts that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And because we believe that, we have life through his name. Amen.